Recently, my comment section has been quite unhappy, and some comments just downright brutal. Why? All because in a recent video, I back dragged a file. That's right, I got roasted because I drug my file backwards. If you've never used a file before, the proper technique looks something like this. You push the file forward, cutting the material. Then you lift the file up, starting the process all over again. The other method to file is just not lift at all, lightly dragging it backwards. This helps keep the file contacting the work, giving me more accurate results. But the internet is telling me that this is wrong. Heck, even textbooks are too. But to me this is really strange, because nobody says to lift on the backstroke when using a die filer machine, or a hacksaw, or even a sawzall. And all of these have cutting blades with teeth in one direction. I'd like to learn a little bit more about backdragging a file, so today I'm going to use all these parts that I found in the shop and build the ultimate file testing machine. I need to find a way to push the file forward and backwards thousands of times, at a consistent speed and stroke length, and then devise some sort of mechanism to push the work into the file and then lift it on the backstroke. To get this project started, I think the best tool to use is my 36 inch Cincinnati Shaper. If this is your first time ever seeing a shaper, well, its design is pretty simple. It converts rotary motion into linear motion. The beauty of it is, is it has everything I need. I can control the stroke length, the speed, and it can do this multiple times without ever breaking down. If you want to see the shaper in action and actually see what it's really made for, I have a video talking all about it. It's pretty interesting stuff. Because I'm going to be building several components to mount to the shaper, I need a nice sturdy base plate to start from. This is a drill press fixture plate. This plate I built to expand your drill press table. But this is going to work perfect on the shaper here for this fixture because now I can put anything I want using the 5 8 holes or the half inch 13 tapped holes that are in between that. So this is the perfect base for this setup. The next major component we got to work on is a way to hold the file and then find a way to mount it into the shaper itself. One of the design criteria are the file has to be able to come out fast and easy and to be able to flip over to perform the test rather quickly. All the tests are going to be done on 10 inch length files. The framework doesn't need to change in length at all, but it does need to be pretty strong, so that's why I'm going to be using a quarter inch plate steel for the framework. I would like the holder to be able to grip the file by the tang. This is going to mimic holding the file with your hand. I also have to prevent the file from twisting, so adding some backstops to the holder will prevent that from happening. This was also a good time to drill and tap some holes into the framework to be able to mount some tabs to this thing a little bit later on. Unfortunately, the file is a little bit thinner than my quarter inch plate steel. This is going to prevent my tab that's going to hold the file in place from gripping onto it. This is an easy fix. All I have to do is machine a pocket so that the tang can sit proud of the holder. In order to remove the file quickly, I want to install a tab. So all I need to do is tap a hole in this thing and the tab can bolt right to that. I'd like this file holder to be able to bolt it into the shaper just like any other shaper tool would. This is going to require a 1x2 solid bar that's going to get mounted right inside the clapper box. This is a really critical moment. This piece of bar stock needs to be welded perfectly 90 to the file holder. This ensures that the tool moves linear with the axes of the machine. To make sure the block gets welded perfectly 90, I'm using what I call the minion square. This square is pretty special because it has a 60 degree and of course your standard 90 degree corner on it. To reduce some of the vibration that the fixture might have, I'm adding the strong back, which is just a piece of one inch by quarter flat bar. It also ties the bar that goes into the shaper to the tip of the tool. I'm using some magnetic shim blocks to elevate the fixture up off the table. This is going to give me the clearance I need to weld this flat bar perfectly 90 to the spine of the tool. I'm going to be using some stitch welds to tie everything together. This is going to prevent warping, but still give me the strength I need to hold everything nice and tight. And then I added some of these bump tabs. These are fully adjustable, but I'll be talking about those a little bit later. This is the file holder that's going to be doing the majority of the work and it just slips into this tool post holder just like a normal tool would on the shaper. Tighten this up and then we will indicate it in to make sure we're nice and square and straight 
and perpendicular and all those angles that we need to keep this accurate. I'm gonna use these coupons. It's a piece of hot rolled steel, three quarters by three quarters or 19 millimeter by 19 millimeter. It has a threaded hole into the back and they're all gonna be the same. Uh, what we'll do is we'll measure the length before and then we'll measure the length after and we'll take the difference. That way we have something to gauge from. The next major component we need to fabricate is some way to hold that coupon. Something that's gonna be nice and sturdy and of course adjustable. I'm water jet cutting some base plates. These are gonna share the same two inch grid pattern that the drill press plate has. I'm making sure to add in some height adjustment with some tapped holes and making sure everything's true and 90 as best as possible. So I'm using some one, two, three blocks and some really careful welding. I really want fast and easy adjustments. So I'm adding some thumb screws. I'm able to make the adjustment by thumb and then come back with the tool a little bit later to really cinch it down if I need to. This is basically a holder for the coupon. This is gonna allow the coupon to slide in and out and give it that support that it needs when the file is cutting across from it. It's gonna keep the chatter out and it has a pretty good fit. It's not too tight, not too loose. So this little coupon holder gets bolted down to this table with the ball lock bolts. In order to push and pull that coupon in and out of this receiver tube, I'm gonna be using a little tiny air cylinder. So of course we need to build a bracket for that. I'm using that same slotted base plate that I used for the receiver tube because I think that works pretty good. Gives me a lot of adjustment. The air cylinder has a threaded portion on the front of the body and that's a perfect spot to be able to mount it to the bracket. And it gets mounted into this little nifty holder just like this. And now the cylinder has a threaded rod on the end of it and I can thread the coupon right to the end of this guy. We'll make sure we put a jam nut on here so he doesn't want to come off. But there's not a lot of support for this thing, and you can see it wants to twist in the cylinder, so that's why we need the receiver tube. The receiver has some adjustment bolts so we can get them dialed up. I need to regulate the air, and this is what's going to control the pressure that the cylinder has. I need to build a bracket that's going to hold a switch. The switch's job is to turn off the air so that the cylinder can return back to neutral, bringing back the coupon. This switch bracket is going to take some serious abuse, so I'm making sure to add some gussets and making sure it's nice and strong. I'm using the Fireball Magnetic 1-2-3 blocks and it's perfect for this type of setup. So in order to get it to lift on the return stroke, we're going to use this toggle switch and it goes inside of this bracket right here. So we got our switch mounted to the bracket. The switch goes into the slot. So now that the switch is mounted, I'll show you how this works. This is an adjustment plate and these are the stops. This sets where the cylinder is going to be pulling in and out. So it's going to trip that switch back and forth and hitting those two bump stops. This cylinder is a spring return. So when we apply air to it, it's going to go out. When the switch hits it, the air gets bled off and the spring returns the cylinder back. I want to remove the variable of chips getting clogged into the file. So I'm adding this chip wiper, I mean toothbrush. We're going to put this toothbrush up against the file, hopefully wiping all those little shavings off. I have a file card to also do that, but this file card is just too big, so that's why we're using the toothbrush. To keep track of where we're at, I need to add some way to count the strokes. If there's a problem with the rig, I want to be able to shut this thing off, make some adjustments, and then keep going. But the strokes are going to allow me to keep things consistent. And we're going to mount it right here. And this little lever, this arm is going to trip the counter and keep track for us. You may be wondering why the file is perpendicular to the table instead of parallel with it. I don't have a lot of room with this air cylinder and slug to be able to mount them vertically. Two, I want to be able to see the cut. I want to be able to identify if there's a problem with the file. I want to be able to maybe put the high-speed camera up and look at the teeth. I want to see if there's any wear. I want to monitor the actual coupon itself so now it won't be hidden. Basically, you just need to be able to see everything and this is the best orientation to do that. Well, I'm really happy the way the fixture turned out. It holds that file perfect, just like I wanted, but I have a lot of tests to do, so it's gonna take me a little while. So until then, I will see you guys on the testing video.